word to wise Grass only greener when it's fertilized Gave them truth in these songs, they prefer the lies That's any beautiful adrift in her purple life Before we get started, it only takes two clicks to become one of Earth's mightiest subscribers Click, click what is up, Earth's Mightiest subscribers? Before we jump into today's video, I wanted to talk to you about this really awesome app, Amino. Amino is a really cool social media app. You can find all sorts of different communities that are centered around the things that you love, like whether it's anime, comic books, wrestling, video games, cosplay. Chances are, if there's something you love, you can find a community centered around it. You can even follow people like myself who are content creators and check out our stories and get notifications when we post new content. So what you should be doing right now is clicking the link in the description to go to Amino, download the app, follow your boy The Blur Without Fear, and that way you can keep up with the stories I post. Don't worry, this video's not going anywhere. I'll wait while you go do that. Oh, you're back, that was quick. Let's get into the video. What is up, Earth's mightiest subscribers? It's Ernie, Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. Got my handy dandy notes. So we are gonna be talking about Jonathan Hickman and Pepe Larraz's House of X, number two, and the 10 lives of Maura McTaggart. And we're gonna talk about that right now. I warned everybody that during House of X number one, Powers of 10 number one, that House of X number two was gonna be a doozy. So I hope you're sitting down. Also, I apologize if I sound weird, still sick. But anyways, this issue is, as one would expect, because she is literally plastered all over the cover, this issue is about the many lives of Moya McTaggart, a character who made their first appearance in Uncanny X-Men number 96 back in 1975. Publication-wise, she is one of the oldest characters in the X-Men's history. And today, Jonathan Hickman has done something that he promised he would do, and is that he would change the way that we look at mutants today. And one of the ways he does that is change the way we look at Moira McTaggart. Now, you're probably wondering, like, okay, well, what does she have to do with mutants? She's a normal human. That's what's changed. <laughs> the first of Moira's lives, she enrolled in an academy at age eight. She you know, grew up to age 15 where she met what would eventually become the love of her life, Kenneth Cohen. They got married at age 19 and she had three children, Callum, Dean, and Abigail. It was a simple life. It was free of mutants, free of adventure, free of wonder. She even died of natural causes at age 74. This was maybe the second, possibly third longest of her 10 lives. Now, by the time you get to life two, this is when Moya realizes she's a mutant. So she doesn't really understand it at the time. She doesn't really fully grasp it at this precise moment, but she remembers her previous life. She remembers everything. Even as a baby, she remembers how to walk. Even as a child, she remembers how to do things that she knew how to do when she was a good and grown woman. This is Mora's mutant power. You see, Mora has the ability to reincarnate herself. And this is a 100% completely passive power. This isn't something that she controls. This is something that just happens when she dies. Now, the funny thing about this method of reincarnation is that she doesn't necessarily move on in time and come back at a later date. She goes back to the point that she normally would have been born. And she relives her life with full knowledge of everything that has happened before it. Bacana. Essentially, she's hot girl. And as one would imagine, if you have lived your life before and you know every single thing that's gonna happen, you know how to do every single thing that you want to do, you know every choice that you're going to make, even not doing anything, just simply observing can change your future. She met her would-be husband, Kenneth Cohen, at the same age, but she knew everything about him already. She knew all his flaws. She knew everything that you could possibly know about a person, so it took everything out of it, and she didn't fall in love with him. She didn't marry him. She did not have those three children. And then it finally happens that she sees Charles Xavier on television, someone who she remembers from her days in school. And it's the moment that Charles reveals himself as a mutant to humanity on live television. And it's at this point that she realizes, yes, this is the moment. Yes, I think that I'm a mutant. I want to go meet this man and try and learn more about what I am. But before she can actually get to him, her plane crashes and she dies and she's reincarnated again. 
Now on Life 3, she winds up becoming obsessed with psychology and biology, fully throwing herself into academia. And while she's in school, she remembers the man Charles Xavier, and knowing what she knows about him from her past life, she realizes this guy, for all his good intentions, yes, he has a dream, yes, he wants to see the right things done, but he kind of has a god complex. And between recognizing this, and most of all a developing self-hatred of herself and her abilities, she winds up using her obsession with biology and psychology to find a way to cure the mutant X gene. And it took many years for her to do it, and even after she did, she never got a chance to use it. The lab where she developed the cure was attacked by Mystique and Pyro all working for the mutant Destiny. Those of you who are familiar with the character knows that Destiny has the ability to see the future. And one of the things that Destiny finds very interesting about all this is that she was never able to sense that Moira McTaggart was a mutant. She can't see Moya in any future humanly possible. All she can see is time and the future bending around her. Basically seeing Moya as this empty spot where the world and time bends around her. And as she puts, a mutant who is invisible to other mutants. And for those of you who are familiar with shows like Kamen Rider, Denno, essentially... Moira is a fixed point. No matter what happens in time, she will always be the same, and she is largely unaffected by it. And even though she normally wouldn't be able to see her after learning what it is exactly that she's looking for, Moira is no longer invisible to her. Destiny is there for a very specific reason, because she has seen the future of what Moira is about to do. The fact that she has created the cure for mutants. And because of this, despite the fact that Moira has good intentions with this, Destiny sees what humanity will do with it. That yes, maybe she created it for herself. Maybe she created it for mutants who don't want to be mutants anymore. But at the end of the day, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And Destiny makes Moira a promise that if she continues down this path, seeking to destroy mutant kind with a cure, if she ever tries this again, Destiny will find her, no matter where she is, no matter what she does, even if she tries to kill Destiny, Destiny will see it coming and will get her first. And then no matter what, Moya will always know that Destiny is out there. And Destiny will always be aware that Moya is out there. But only one of them knows what the future holds. Destiny reveals to Moya that she is not immortal. She is not trapped in some internal loop. That she has seen Moya McTaggart's 10 lives, possibly an 11th, if she makes the right choices. Her powers will stop reincarnating her eventually. She also reveals a loophole in Moya's powers that if she dies as a child before her powers manifest, which they always manifest at age 13, if she dies before then, the loop ends. And even though Moira doesn't necessarily believe her at first, she is starting to see Destiny's way of thinking, and Destiny hits Moya with a very important question. With your next life, are you going to help your people, or are you going to hurt? your people. And even though Moya asks Destiny not to kill her, Destiny tells her that this is what you deserve for a life lived poorly, and commands Pyro to burn Moya alive slowly so that when she dies this time, through all her future lives, she'll remember exactly what this moment felt like. She'll never forget it. This is the galvanizing moment for Moira McTaggart. And just like you would imagine, when Moira is born for a fourth time, she uses this time wisely. She throws herself even further into studying biology and even discovering what she calls the human mutant dilemma. The fact that if two aggressive species share the same space at the same time, that one of them has to become dominant. That helps her even further believe the idea that maybe mutants really are the next step in human evolution. With this new perspective, she accepts the fact that she's a mutant, and when she meets Charles Xavier, she falls in love with him. They get married, and the Xavier Institute for Gifted Youngsters is born from it. And honestly, the history as we know it of the X-Men happens. Moira McTaggart sees the entire X-Men history that we know unfold. Everything from Days of Future Past to the Dark Phoenix Saga, to House of M, to Avengers vs. X-Men. And eventually, she dies the way that Destiny foretold humanity and their extinction machines. Now, by the time we get to Life 5, Moira plays things a little more aggressively. She seeks out Charles Xavier 
10 whole years earlier than she originally would have met him, shares all of her past memories. And Charles Xavier seeing everything that Moira McTaggart has experienced it radicalizes him. And instead of creating the Xavier Institute for Gifted Youngsters, he creates something else entirely. He doesn't create a school. He creates a society, a legion. Together, they establish the mutant nation of Faraway, a place where mutants can be safe from humans and live in isolation and not have to be bothered with the troubles of the outside world. But in the end, just as Destiny warned Moira, the Sentinels were going to come all the same. And during the mutant genocide at Faraway, Moira is killed. Now, when you get to Life 7, Moira realizes that the Sentinels all come from the same place. The same name always pops up in history when the Sentinels arrive. Trask. So what she does is at an early age, she enrolls herself in the military, gains all the necessary training that she would need, and she dedicates her life to systematically eliminating the entire Trask bloodline. None Bolivar, Donald, Gwyneth, Simon, everyone. But time and nature always want to happen. And artificial intelligence, much like nature, also wants to happen. And much like how mutants were the next step in human evolution, sentinels were born just the same. Moira stumbles upon a facility where she finds the first sentinels being created. She finds Master Mold, the exterminator of her seventh life. Now by the time you get to life eight, Moira didn't spend her life with Charles Xavier. She rejected him. She placed her bets on another mutant. Eric Magnus Lencher, Magneto. Bacana. Much like she did with Charles in her fifth life, she shared everything with Magneto, told him about all of her past lives and what humanity would do to mutants in futures to come. And this radicalized Magneto, even more so than he probably already was. She helped him conquer America and create the House of M. And I know this is one of those situations where a lot of people were asking questions in the comments about, oh, well, where are the Avengers and all this? Where are, you know, the Fantastic Four and all this? Why is all this crazy stuff happening and no one else is showing up to do anything about it? Well, it just so happens you have your answer. They do show up. The mutants and the rest of Earth's Mightiest Heroes band together and take down Magneto, killing him during the War of M. Moira was imprisoned for her crimes against humanity, and she died at age 38 during a failed prison break. And this, mind you, is the shortest of her many lives. Now, by the time you get to Life 9, Moira has seen just about everything, and she realizes she's almost at the end of her rope. At age 18, she tracks down the whereabouts of Apocalypse, and she awakens him. <laughs> Some really weird shades of X-Men Apocalypse going on here, which, I don't know, maybe if they'd have went this route, maybe they should have hired Jonathan Hickman, it probably would have made a better movie. But in doing this, she places her faith in Apocalypse's mantra of survival of the fittest, not because she thinks that he's right, but because it's the one option she really hasn't tried. And with her 10, possibly 11 lives running out, it's time to try crazy for a change. And with Moira by his side, Apocalypse murders Xavier and Magneto and enslaves Mr. Sinister. Apocalypse and Moira together form the X-Men, and by year 42, they wage open war against humanity and their machines. In the Apocalypse War that rages on for decades, and is quite possibly Moira's longest life. And eventually, at some point, she dies. We don't really know when. But eventually, she does, and in utero, it's when Moira has an idea, the spark that lights the flame. She realizes that the old ways, they're not working. The old ways of thinking are not working. It's time to break the rules. It's time to break the wheel. And this is what brings us to that fateful moment we saw in House of X number one, where Moira revealed everything to Charles, as presumably the same as she did in her fifth life, but this time showing Charles so many more potential possibilities that maybe they might be able to come up with something that could work for a change. And this 10th life is probably closer to what we associate with the X-Men timeline. A lot of the same things happen, and of course, this is also the life where she, has, where she gives birth to Proteus. 
Now, this doesn't give us any more answers about Krakoa, but I mean, this tells a very solid story about what is going on with Moira McTaggart. This also gives us a very clear idea about why the X-Men's history, why their publication is kind of a way in story to explain why their timeline is so wishy-washy. Maybe because it's all happened before. Now, I know in this, I left out life six. There's a six life that's missing, and that's that, that wasn't an accident. That's actually on purpose because we don't see it. When we look at the timeline of Moira's many lives, there's a very clear skip at life five to life seven. Now, I'm pretty sure that is on purpose. Judging by looking at the reading order that's at the back of the book, I'm gonna go to limb and say, because it's highlighted in red, we'll probably learn more about this in House of X number five. Another interesting tidbit is that I know uh, there were some people that you know brought up, and I, I think some people in the Discord, some people uh, in the comments I noticed were talking about the whole uh, math thing. It was like, you know, talking about powers of 10 in the last video that I did. Totally get it, but honestly, I'm not a math person, so I didn't even pay it any attention. But we do also learn that that's not the only meaning the powers of 10 that it also kind of connects to Moira McTaggart and her 10 lives. So there's that as well. So we, we learned some things. There's some connections made, but really the big reveal here is that this entire time, Moira has been a mutant and we just didn't know it. But at the end of the day, Moira McTaggart has been solidified as the linchpin of the entire X-Men universe. All roads revolve around Moira and lead back Tamora. She is the fixed point. And this is probably to help make some sense of how crazy the X-Men timeline has been for the last several decades. It's hard to say, but I mean, I, it makes sense to me. There are certain pieces of each of Mora's lives that are kind of legitimate. You think about all the stuff with AVX, House of X, and you know some of the other stuff. It happens in a previous life, her fifth life. And a lot of the other stuff happens in her tent. It's almost as if Jonathan Hickman found a way to make some sense of all of the X-Men's crazy, ridiculous timeline shenanigans. But anyways, let me know what you thought about House of X number two by Jonathan Hickman and Pepe Larraz. Sound off in the comments. So hey, you made it to the end of the video. Awesome for you. If you enjoyed this video, and if you made it this far, I don't see how you didn't, do me a favor, Hulk smash that like button. And if you wanna see more awesome videos like this one, make sure you click subscribe so you can become one of Earth's mightiest subscribers. And tap that bell so you know when I post up. Also, feel free to go check out my Patreon, where if you chuck in a buck, you can get early access to most of my videos up to a week early. And if you have time, make sure you swing by nerd901.com where you can find more of my content as well as other amazing stuff. Anyway, Anyways, until next time, I love you 3000 plus ultra.